Hello, St. Louis. Welcome to the STL Leaders Podcast. This is Brian Bisking. And we have a great show today with Matthew Porter. But before we get started, I want to talk about my two great sponsors, NWO IT Services and Inbound Blend Digital Marketing. At NWO IT Services, downtime is not what you want to worry about. And with the guys over at NWO IT Services, they take that worry away with their month-to-month managed service packages. They handle our IT here at the STL Leaders and they're locally owned and have been in operation for 12 years here in St. Louis. To learn more, visit them at nwoitservices.com. Also brought to you by Inbound Blend Digital Marketing. Inbound Blend Digital Marketing provides affordable month-to-month website and marketing services with plans starting in the hundreds, not thousands. They developed our website, do all of our social media here at the STL Leaders, and I highly recommend that you check them out. To learn more, visit inboundblend.com. And now, to this episode of the STL Leaders Podcast. Hello, St. Louis. This is your host, Brian Bisking, and this is the STL Leaders Podcast. Did you know that there are 2.8 million people that live in the St. Louis metro area? There are many leaders inside of that population. I started this podcast to give those leaders a voice. The STL Leaders Podcast mission is to speak to the leaders of our area to gain insight into their story their journey, and the lessons they have learned along the way. Each episode gives you inside access to the people who make St. Louis what it is today and what it will be in the future. Listen as we dive into what makes each leader so impactful and how they view success, mindset, and leadership. This podcast is brought to you by Synchrony HR, NWO IT Services, Inbound Blend Digital Marketing, and Enterprise Bank and Trust. On this episode of the STL Leaders Podcast, we have Matthew Porter. Matthew Porter is a husband, father, geek, ultramarathoner, entrepreneur, and multiple sclerosis warrior. He is former CEO of Contegix, a cloud computing company he founded and is now the vice chairman. He is also currently the CEO of Invisibly, where the team is working to restore privacy and consent online for people. When not with his family, he can be found getting lost on some trails or running 100-mile races through the mountains. It's my honor to welcome Matthew Porter to the show. Matthew, welcome to the show. I greatly appreciate you taking time to coming on here today and talking to me about your career path and and uh, all the exciting things that we're going to talk about here today. Great. Thank you for having me, Brian. Really do truly appreciate this. Absolutely. Well, um, you know, I reached out to you on LinkedIn. I have uh, actually followed you for years from your time at Contegix to now Invisibly. Um, we never had the opportunity to really meet or, or connect, but I'd always kind of seen you uh, out there and what you were doing. And, uh, you know, when I started this podcast, I started it to have leaders of our community on that um, maybe some people don't know of or haven't heard of. Uh, and I think that you really defined what it is to be an STL leader. And so I'm really excited to share your story uh, with our audience today. And so uh, I'm excited to dive in. Awesome. Let's do it. Let's have fun. Absolutely. Absolutely. So let's start with with just you. Where did you grow up? What was growing up like for you uh, in, your, in your life? I am born, raised, educated, and my kids give me grief when I use this term, um, married and, and have uh, been breeding here. We have three kids. My wife and I are both from North County. I grew up in the Florissant area. We lived in a fairly modest lifestyle, having eight sisters, one brother through a blended family was unique and interesting. But, you know, it wasn't it wasn't a life of excess, but it was more than enough for what we needed. And I am actually truly appreciative of that actually much more now than I think at the time. But we grew up with modest resources available to us, a predominantly union family. My mom and dad worked at the same factory from almost the start of their adult life to the end of it. In fact, actually, they both retired from the same place where they met. But it was it was hard and it was unique and it was good. And I am grateful for the person it made me. Absolutely. Well, I think, you know, everybody has um, a story and that story makes you who you are. Right. And so uh, it's I always like to kind of start to give our listeners a little background on on the person and kind of, you know, 
what life was like growing up for you? You didn't just become the CEO of a of a, a great company one day, right? There was a, a journey to get there, which brings me to you know how I originally uh, heard of you or, or, or known of you, which was Contigix. Talk to me about Contigix um, and that whole career path for you. Well, I will be more than happy to talk about that. I you reminded me of something when you when you talked about us. You know, people not having this path that defines them to be a CEO. I remember having a conversation with my grandma about what we were doing at Contigix, and she said, "We don't do that here." And I was really curious about why she said that and what she actually meant. And in her mind, she said, "We don't do that here," and it was the "we" here. And in her mind, the "we" was "we." Our family doesn't go build companies. And the here is we don't build that in St. Louis. People don't build companies anymore. And that was a very interesting, enlightening statement from my grandma. It was also one that while I love her and she's since passed on, I also vehemently disagreed with her. I thought that, yes, a kid that grew up with modest means in North County and his buddy could actually go off and create a company. And we did that. And we did that with Contigix. And we started working in a supply closet. And I don't mean figuratively. We were literally in a supply closet. And there was a fence separating us from the supplies. I don't think they thought we were going to steal them. I think <laughs> it was more for separation. But it was a supply closet. And we started on what is now called cloud computing 20 years ago. And people thought we were idiots. There, there's no, almost no other word for it. They thought we were crazy. They thought we were idiots. They thought people will never take their servers or their infrastructure. And we're talking still physical servers and physical infrastructure and take it out of their server room in a building and give it to a random stranger to put it into a big data center. And yeah. more important, not just take the servers, but Contigix was known and still known for actually managing the infrastructure, managing everything from the applications through the operating system down to the all the flashy blinky lights on it. It was a hell of a journey, though, and it was a blast. And I will always describe an entrepreneurial venture like that as having a way of expanding time. Our worst, you know, our worst years were 50, 54 percent compounded annual growth. That's a rocket ship. Yeah, uh, absolutely it is. And and you you know to, to that point, you started something and grew it to a, a fairly large organization. And then in 2016, you stepped down as CEO. Is that right? Talk to us about that and the challenges that 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 came from that. So, I I feel like I was really truly blessed because almost entirely through my career, I've had people that had no reason to guide me and yet did that from bob olwig over at worldwide technology and my time there from my boss prior to that at ibm to the mentors that i've had over the past 10 to 15 years and our timeline on contigix was we sold on october 30th 2016 a majority of the company to private equity and my business partner and i still own a lot of shares in the company and I still serve on the board. That was a Sunday night that we signed those documents. I walked in on Monday for a half a day because I was pretty emotionally uh, exhausted and tired physically from that ordeal of actually selling the company, which was the right thing to do. And we made the right reasons. We had the right reasons to actually sell the company. And then I walked in on Tuesday and notified my team. And I stayed for about two and a half hours total for that day and also told them that a CEO that the private equity and we had hired and had been working with for about 45 days would be starting on Thursday and would be in the office on Thursday. And I walked out. And it's it's the question that I get asked most about when it comes to contagics from other entrepreneurs and leaders. How could you walk out two days after selling the company? And for me, it, it comes down to a couple things. I was blessed to have a mentor 
That's why I brought this up early on in the answer, who relayed this concept and idea to me of knowing your 100 miles. And what he meant by that is, it's in reference to, according to him, and I've never verified this, that back in the day, steamboats would go up and down the, the river. And along the way, they would pick up people that knew the next 100 miles or so of that river. It could be 50, it could be 125, we'll just say 100 miles. And that person knew that 100 miles forwards and backwards. But he, because at that time it was always a male, he didn't step outside of that 100 miles. He got dropped off on the shore. He was no longer temporarily captain. And a boat would take and pick him up and bring him back to the starting point because he knew that 100 miles. And a mentor said to me, that's kind of the trick is knowing your 100 miles and being comfortable to know that the boat doesn't make the entire journey without somebody that knows that 100 miles because those are treacherous waters. Those are difficult. And I knew where Contigix was at that point where we were now this, like, this united company of four companies combined. That wasn't my 100 miles. My 100 miles was the supply closet to getting there. Yeah. The, the other factor in this is, is when I get asked by entrepreneurs about this, I, I always ask them to tell me who they are. And I get really concerned if they start the answer off with, I'm an owner, I'm a president, I'm a CEO. Because that oftentimes means I don't think they're ready to move on. I have an amazing family. I have an amazing wife who I've been with since we met at Kmart in 1993. <laughs> we have three incredible kids. And my identity was never tied up into a title, into being CEO or being an owner or being a shareholder. I knew that I was a husband, a father, uh, uh, somebody with dealing with multiple sclerosis, you know, a friend. I knew who I was on what I would want on my tombstone one day, hopefully far off in the future. Absolutely. And I knew that I never wanted it to say CEO or president. Yeah. So to me, that was, that was an easy thing. Yeah. And the third thing is, you know, I had the possibility of sticking around after I sold in some type of chief visionary officer role. And I just knew that to some people, I would always be the CEO. And in order to give the CEO that we hired, and more important, our team and all that talent a chance, I, there couldn't be two CEOs roaming around, even if one didn't have it by title, but I was gonna have it by emotion from some of the folks. And that's not fair to them, and that's definitely not fair to that CEO. And now for a quick break, we bring in our sponsor, Synchrony HR. Do you struggle with HR? Are you tired of the rising cost of benefits? Synchrony HR here in St. Louis helps organizations streamline their administration, provides HR consulting, and offers unique access to Fortune 500 benefits by pooling small groups to access large group benefits. To learn more, visit SynchronyHR.com. And now back to this episode of the STL Leaders Podcast with Matthew Porter. Well, and, and and now you're you're CEO again of a of a of another venture, <laughs> another company, Invisibly. Uh, talk to us about Invisibly, what your path was to get there, and, and furthermore, tell us a little bit about Invisibly and what you guys do. So, I've known Jim McKelvey, the co-founder of Square, probably close to a decade, and we've had a friendship for this entire time. And Jim talked to me about Invisibly about right right about a month and a half, two months after I had sold Contigix and talk to me about what they were doing. And they're really trying to solve, at the time, they were trying to solve a major problem that still exists today in the advertising technology ecosystem. Whereas publishers aren't actually getting a lot of that money, it's it's really is a broken model in that. And that's for no, a whole other time to talk about. And in July of 2019, I joined the company after about two months of talking with Jim because I loved the job I had at the time. I was the chief innovation officer at Clayco, you know, a $3 billion construction company that's um, in St. Louis and Chicago. Loved that job, loved that culture. And I also knew that I wanted to be the leader again. And 
I kind of felt that I wanted to go off and create technology again, not just be a consumer of technology, which even when you're the chief innovation officer at a, at a company like Clayco, which gives you lots of freedom to actually go out and innovate, I knew that most of my job would be the consumption of technology, traditional IT, even the, the cool stuff like drones and you know BIM and virtual design and construction. And so Jim started talking to me about this and he gave me a perspective about that, I think his text message was, you're a mighty Siberian Husky, you need to be running the Iditarod. And that kind of instilled in me this, this idea that I actually wanted to go do this again. And I was frankly surprised that I wanted to jump back out on that ledge of being an entrepreneur. And I joined the company as chief operating officer. Our first board meeting, Jim is there, I am there. Invisibly is backed by not just McKelvey though, Invisibly is backed by Founders Fund and it's backed by Peter Thiel and it's backed by some big family offices. So we have you know, big players that are backing Invisibly at this time and the board makes the decision and it wasn't entirely going to be known to me, but the board makes the decision at my recommendation as the chief operating officer that we need a full-time CEO because McKelvey is extremely busy with everything he has going on, even as a square board member and on the federal reserve board here in St. Louis, he had a lot going on and was our CEO and he didn't have all the time to do all of that. Yeah. And so after about 35 minutes, of me standing outside the board meeting, Jim comes out and says, hey, you need to get back in that board meeting. Okay, what's going on? Because I'm the chief operating officer. <laughs> and he says, well, you need to get back in the board meeting because we just appointed you CEO. <laughs> and so that was how I became CEO of Invisibly. And it's been a wonderful experience. And Jim has really given me the reins to actually become CEO. And to me, yeah. that is what I was looking at when he sent the mighty Siberian Husky text message, because I wanted to have the ability to define the culture. I sure. wanted it to be something that I thought was going to serve our mission and our vision and our values that we had. And so today, here we are now, 15, 16 months later, and we are doing what people probably have some little taste of that's a problem on the internet today. We are attempting and will succeed in restoring consent and privacy for consumers and end users. I like to tell people that if you've taken the time to watch The Social Dilemma on Netflix, that's great. And I think everybody should watch it. And there is a little bit of you know, stirring the emotions from the viewer. But, and I do intentionally mean but, to negate that what I just said, the social dilemma is the Walt Disney princess G-rated version of what reality is in terms of how we as consumers have our privacy and consent violated. And I don't want that world for me, even though in some ways, Contigix, with all of its infrastructure, we were hosting a lot of that stuff that ended up doing that. Yeah. I don't want it for me, and I, I sure as hell don't want it for my kids. Sure. Well, it, it is kind of uh, sometimes creepy, uh, if I'm being, to, to, to see sometimes, you know, I, I talk about this all the time with my wife is, I know, and I, I, know, I know this doesn't truly happen, at least I don't think it does, but I'll, I'll say something about, we need a new fire pit for our house, and I feel like the next thing I know uh, I got a fire pit ad showing me on Facebook or Twitter or something along those lines. And, and sometimes it, it, it's kind of creepy how, how, how that all works. It is very, very creepy. And Brian, I don't think these devices are listening to us and reporting all back because we give them more than enough information. Right. They don't even need to do it. Right. They just don't. Right. I mean, it's frankly disturbing. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's it's it is sometimes eye opening when you when you see those factors. I I know enough about it from the standpoint of you know you you make one click, it drops a cookie on your site, and uh, and the next thing you know, there's advertisements from all these different um, you know, vendors or or whatever you have. But yeah, it's it's it is pretty interesting and it's pretty um 
it's pretty pretty eye opening at times. And the the big problem today is because if anybody's in the know on this, they're probably saying yes, but there are laws to to fix this. There's in Europe, there's GDPR, and in California, there's a CCPA. And a month ago, they just passed version 2.0 of that. What's effectively being called version 2.0 of that, and that's a you know California Consumer Privacy Act about how we're going to go ahead and protect people's data that you as a user have the right to ask a company if they do business in California or have infrastructure in California or headquartered in California or you're a California resident that you have the right to ask for your data to to get a copy of that and to delete it. And that yeah. sounds all good and well, but if there's no tool to actually do that and there's no ease to do that and it causes you a lot of friction, then it's not going to happen except for a small minority people that really are so enraged or concerned about it. I, mean, yeah. I like to remind people that you know, for a long time, we had the ability to report and review companies. People used to send in letters through the USPS to the Better Business Bureau. And you could write the Better Business Bureau and say, hey, I want information on you know, Brian and Matthew's house of waffles and shoes and they would send you a report back on them. Hey, they're great, they're good, whatever. And we always had that right to do that. We had that capability to do it, but the problem was there was too much friction to do it, and there was too much of a delay to do it. So what happens if in GDPR and CCPA, we remove that friction and delay, just like things like the Better Business Bureau came online so you could search, and then you got Yelp, and you got Facebook reviews and Google reviews because those broke down those barriers and walls of friction and time and wait. So what happens if we start doing that with the rights that we're supposed to have through GDPR or CCPA or, or hell, just being a good damn company that should not want to hold people's private data without their consent. And so that's what we're going after. We're building those tools and we're letting people engage in that. I mean, I talked to my team regularly about how as somebody who runs ultra marathons i don't mind seeing shoe ads as somebody yeah. with multiple sclerosis i don't mind seeing ads about what's going on in the research and the medicine and the disease modifying therapies on that but i, I don't want to see ads for wheelchairs for my ms and yet that has happened to me well you know that that segues into a big part of this podcast episode that I wanted to talk to you about which is uh you know you mentioned a couple times here your MS your multiple sclerosis uh and you just mentioned your ultra marathons um first off talk to me about how you got into ultra marathons um and then how has MS uh, uh impacted you and how have you had to overcome that when you're when you're doing these long runs my my daughter is to blame for all the ultra marathons and every time <laughs> i say that she giggles because uh, she is she is actually really she's the start of this she's the one that uh, you know lit the match to some degree in march of 2010 i'm tucking this little beautiful six-year-old girl into bed her mom my wife had just told her the story about how the weekend that we got married, she went home and stayed with Gigi and Papa, her, my daughter's grandparents. And, you know, she's in that romance phase, princessy phase of, uh, of being a, a little girl. And that night I tuck her in and she asks me, can I come back and stay with you and mom when I get married? Of course you can, sweetie. You can always come stay with mom and me. We love you. She's like, I want to have like mom did with Gigi and Papa. And I tuck her in and she gives me a big hug and a big kiss. And as I'm about ready to get up off the bed, she pops up out of the bed and she looks at me and she pokes me in my stomach. She says, you have a lot of squishy. I don't know if you're going to make it. And after going downstairs and telling my wife, hey, let me tell you what your daughter just said. Because at that moment in time, she's not <laughs> my daughter. She's your daughter. Right, right. Uh, I, I, just, I decided to go for a run. I was like, I'm going to go for a run tomorrow. And I had a buddy who had done some ultra marathons and I texted him and I said, Hey, I'm going to start running. And he goes, okay, great. Text me tomorrow when you're done. And so I texted him the following day and he goes, how'd it go? What well, probably made it 150 yards. He goes, okay, tomorrow we make it 175. 
And it took about two and a half, three years. I had lost a considerable amount of weight. I really dialed in my diet. And I had ran my first ultra marathon about three years later and kind of became hooked because I liked that time out in the woods because all my ultra marathons, all my races are really trail races. I liked that time away, that time to think and really truly re-energize. And the unique thing that happened is four and a half years to the exact day of when I started that first run that I didn't make it more than 150 yards. I was sitting in a doctor's office with my wife and we knew what was going to happen that day because my wife was the one who received my MRI because she ordered it as an adult nurse practitioner. And we knew what was gonna happen. And that was, I was going to be diagnosed with MS. And my incredible doctor walked in and he said, Mr. Porter, you have 38 lesions on your brain and spine and we stopped counting. Wow. You're gonna get diagnosed with MS today. And I'd already had the other tests like a lumbar puncture or what's commonly called a spinal tap and a visual uh, response test and all of these things. And the funniest thing is that because we had days, if not weeks to digest this, you know, we're, we're now on this whole theory of, okay, let's, let's figure out what we're going to do next. Let's, my wife and I, let's figure out what we're going to do next. How are we going to address this? How are we going to fight this? And so she asked the immediate question of, hey, should he stop running? And the doctor says, you know, I'm looking at your chart. I've seen people with 38 lesions that can't walk through my door. So for you, no, as hard as you can, as fast as you can, for as long as you can. And pretty cool, pretty, cool. pretty powerful, cool story. Yeah, and I just kept doing it, and you know, so now, I'm now done hundred milers. I was just going to ask that. How, how? What's the farthest one you've done? And, and if you, uh, you maybe you know, maybe you don't. How many have you done? I've probably done close to 14 ultra marathons. The longest one that I've done is I did Leadville, the Leadville Trail 100, which is 103 and a half miles, somewhere around there. Uh, and in just under 30 hours. So I barely made cutoff on that. I did that in 2018. Holy cow. And we actually raised about 65,000. Yep. Now, he, and, and you, I mean, the area, I mean, I may, I'm a little ignorant to this, but are, are you stopping at all to like take drinks or eat? Or, I mean, you're, are you just going the whole time? I was going the whole time because I was, uh, I was dealing with a lot of problems and issues. I'd gotten food poisoning uh, the day before. And this is in Leadville, Colorado. So you're, you're climbing up to over 12,600 oh, yeah. feet. You're, 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 I think 20,000 feet of uh, ascent and descent over the entire course. For me, it was just under 30 hours. I started at 4 a.m. on Saturday morning and I finished right before 10 a.m. on Sunday morning. And oh. I'm stopping, but I'm stopping to go to the bathroom for two, three minutes and, and, and praying that I don't fall asleep you know, because I've been running for 20 hours and I sat down for the first time when I went to the restroom. Right. So, but right. Yeah. That is, uh, that is impressive all in itself. Um, I mean, just hats off to you. Uh, super impressive. Uh, but even more impressive when you're battling MS, um, has, has, does the MS, I'm assuming the MS affects you in, in a variety of different ways, uh, especially when you're running. It does. It, it's, Yesterday, for the past week, I've been in pretty much pain the last week. My pain is usually on a two to three on a scale of one to ten. Uh, I, I'm susceptible to a thing that we refer to as the MS hug, which is basically your intercostal muscles contracting and not wanting to let go. And extreme temperatures, which Colorado has even in August, uh, neurological stress, which running for 20 plus hours will do to the body, uh, they all put risks of flare-ups or exacerbations. Uh, for me, my exacerbations mean an intense level of pain. It's the level, of what I refer to as, uh, it's it's like being on fire without the heat. It, mm -hmm. it feels to that degree of how the pain is. Uh, it causes some challenges with my gait. 
So in 2016, when I ran Leadville and I tore a hamstring, and then again in 2018, when I ran Leadville, I ended up with uh, a slight lean to my left-hand side. I couldn't walk straight for probably two or three days. In fact, actually, I gave a speech four days after that, and I had to violate all the rules of giving a talk in front of people, and I'm leaning on the podium, and I'm also wearing flip-flops uh, with a sports coat. But it's it, it's it's a lot of pain. It's a lot of stress. It puts me at severe risk uh, when I do it to some degree because this isn't normal. This isn't the normal life. Yeah. So I'm assuming you still have aspirations to keep going. I mean, you're going to keep doing them, I would assume? Yes. Uh, I would have been in Leadville you know, a few months ago if it wasn't for the pandemic. I'm sure. headed back out to Leadville again. Uh, in August, I'm um, seeing what else we'll do in, coming up in 2021, because while these races aren't for fundraising by the race organizers, uh, I'm blessed to have people that that have some level of love uh, and maybe some people that just want to see me in pain. And so I have a number of people uh, that watch the races and a fair amount of people that actually donate on a per mile basis. So I, I like to say that I sent out emails to everybody and said, if you love me, donate a certain amount per mile. And if you hate me and just want to see me in pain, donate two to three times as much. <laughs> well, look, I, I would just tell you, um, for me, it's pretty impressive. I, I you know, hats off to you. It's it's um, it's encouraging. You know, I, I'm running a 5K this Saturday and, and, and that doesn't even <laughs> that that's not even close to what you're doing. But, you know, for me, a 5K is like running an ultra marathon. But I got my brother in law. His name's Mike Kirchhoff. He. He does a lot of running, um, half Ironmans, marathons, a lot of racing, and you know he's been pushing me to get into running. And so you know you got to start somewhere, right? Just like just like you did with the 150 yards and 175 yards, you got to start somewhere. And so uh, I'm trying to get into it myself, but um, it's, awesome. it's pretty impressive what you're doing. Thank you, sir. Absolutely. You got to keep going past 5K. That's when the endorphins kick in. Like that's when the good feelings start. Don't stop. Yeah, yeah, you're well, yeah, I I don't know where I'm going to go from here, but you got to start somewhere. That's all I can say. Look, Matt, I want to I want to be respectful of your time and I appreciate everything you you know this po podcast episode, but I want to end this with if you have one piece of advice for anybody listening to this episode, whether it's about, you know, leadership or entrepreneurship or whether it's about life in general, what piece of advice would you give to our audience? Go find mentors and realize that you provide just as much value to them as they can for you. And St. Louis is blessed. And I do truly mean this. I know this is a very St. Louis focused podcast, but St. Louis is truly blessed because our Midwestern appreciation and hospitality is also what means a mentor is gonna say, I will absolutely help you. And they will do it in a selfless manner. And yeah. there are plenty of people out there that that want to help and serve others. It's just I think it's just built into who we are and it makes us stronger if we let us if we let us engage that. Yeah, I absolutely agree. I, I think that's great advice. I, I tell people all the time that, you know, surround yourself with people who are going to push you to be better. Um, and so I think, you know, having mentors or coaches are, are, are very important. So. Matthew Porter, on behalf of the STL Leaders Podcast, I appreciate what you're doing here in the St. Louis community. I appreciate you coming on this uh, podcast and sharing your wisdom today. Thank you. My pleasure, Brian. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of the STL Leaders Podcast. This episode was brought to you by Synchrony HR. Do you struggle with HR? Are you tired of rising costs and benefits? Synchrony HR here in St. Louis helps organizations streamline their administration, provides HR consulting, and offers unique access to Fortune 500 benefits. To learn more, visit SynchronyHR.com.